Before I start, I want to give a shout out to Barb Roth, who asked me to do this presentation way back in the uh, fall of 2013. It feels like a very distant time from, from now, but I thank her. And then I want to thank Rayette Martin uh, for setting it all up and Samantha for being here, uh, holding my hand through the presentation. So thank you all. Um, I've been a faculty member here at Desert Research Institute uh, since about 2019. And it's interesting to uh, wander around Las Vegas and occasionally someone will ask you, well, how long have you lived in Las Vegas? And uh, then I'll say, well, do you want the long story or do you want the short story? <laughs> uh, so I'll give, you, I'll give you the long story as quickly as I can. And that is I have lived in Las Vegas now three times, starting from 1992 up until today. And each time I keep circling back to Las Vegas because I have professional uh, acquaintances here and I will uh, call them up one day and they'll say, hey, I got a great job for you. Why don't you move back to Las Vegas? And for some reason I say, well, yeah, why not? Uh, I, I do have to say before I can do that, I have to ask my wife because if she's not gonna come, then all bets are off, right? So my professional background has nothing to do with Cold War era nuclear resources. In particular, uh, I have dealt with Great Basin mobile foragers and ancestral Pueblo and agriculturalists. But as you can see from the title of my talk, my historic preservation work on the Nevada National Security Site or NNSS covers a very different kind of cultural resource, those directly related to the Cold War. What I'm going to do with this presentation is, first of all, I want to introduce you to the kinds of cultural resources on the NNSS. Uh, and for those of you who are familiar with the resources out there, this may be a bit redundant or boring, or you can tell me more. People like Jeff Wedding, who I saw got on. Anyhow, um, after that, I'm going to talk about Cold War resources and how they are evaluated on the National Register, some under Criteria Consideration G. And, and let me just quote that criteria consideration for you. Properties that have achieved significance within the past 50 years. That would be within my lifetime. Criteria Consideration G is not one commonly used by historic preservation specialists when evaluating resources to the National Register, except perhaps those people who work on federal reservations like myself. Then after that, I will talk uh, and give a presentation about two Cold War era resources that I have recently been tasked with recording. Uh, the first is what are colloquially known as the glass houses, and you'll see why soon. And then the Huron King test chamber. And the picture uh, on that slide that uh, uh, Samantha showed was of the Huron King test chamber. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with the NNSS, what makes it unique is that it was used as the nation's nuclear testing ground from 1951 to 1992. There were 100 atmospheric and 828 underground tests conducted here. And uh, to my knowledge, that is more nuclear tests in one place than any other place on the planet, famously or infamously. The Federal Reserve is located in Southern Knight County. Uh, the entryway to it at Mercury is about 65 miles northwest of Las Vegas. And if you've driven north on US 95 and you've passed Indian Springs, about 15 miles away from Indian Springs to the north, off to your right is the little, little town of Mercury. The NNSS encompasses about 1,360 square miles. That's about 55 miles north to south, and about 30 miles east to west. Now, the NNSS covers a wide range of desert, semi-desert, and montane environments typical of the warm Mojave Desert, 
and the cold Great Basin Desert. For instance, Yucca Flat, and here's a picture of Yucca Flat, is at an elevation of approximately 4,000 feet. It's part of the upper Mojave Desert. And in this figure, you can see it is an, an enclosed alluvial valley that's covered by blackbrush, saltbush, and Joshua tree. There's a big Joshua tree forest on the, on the alluvial fan about, oh, mid, midway through this uh, photograph here. You can also see that there's plenty of invasive cheatgrass and tumble mustard and wheatgrass out there as well, like many alluvial valleys in the uh, Western US. Conversely, the top of Paiute Mesa, located about 45 miles northwest of Yucca Flat, is at about a 6,000 foot elevation and consists of a broad undulating mesa top covered by Big Sage, the characteristic plan of the Great Basin colder desert. Now, cultural resources on the NNSS include a broad range of archaeological sites and architectural resources that can generally be categorized into four main themes. First, there are archaeological resources associated with pre-contact Native Americans. Second, there are ethnographic Paiute and Shoshone habitations, small villages, and related resources. Third, there are historic European American ranching and mining sites that generally post date AD 1900. And then finally, there are Cold War era built environmental resources that include objects, buildings, subsidence craters from nuclear detonations, complex tunnel systems, and even camps and towns like Mercury and the Area 12 camp. And it's important to highlight that the NNSS Cold War era has a period of significance that is between 1951 and 1992. I also want to throw in here that there is, is a small component of World War II era uh, aerial gunnery uh, targets with little two-tack roads that go down to the targets for their maintenance. But this is an, a, a very ephemeral a uh, small scale component matched between the historic U European American and the Cold War nuclear testing. So I'm not gonna talk about that at all. Let me move to the Native American archeological resources. Pre-contact Native American archeological resources on the NSS go back approximately 13,000 years. And these time periods, the Paleo-Indian time period, are referred to by archaeologists as the Clovis period and the Western stem tradition period. And these are denoted, of course, by distinctly shaped projectile points. And I know that there has been raging for quite a long time the discussion about uh, pre Clovis archaeological sites. Uh, and we have yet to identify anything that might resemble that on the NNSS. So I'm not going to even go there in this discussion. There is a large complex of Paleo-Indian sites, Clovis and Western stem tradition sites present in the southwestern corner of the NNSS on the terraces overlooking 40 Mile Wash. And I've highlighted 40 Mile Wash on this, on this uh, slide. And you can see that 40 Mile Wash is quite long. It heads all the way up and drains what's called Paiute and Rainier Mesa at the northern edges of the Nevada National Security Site. And this wash drains into the Amargosa River. For about eight to 10 miles along the terraces overlooking 40 mile wash are campsites that are Clovis and Western tradition in age. Uh, they're one right after the another, some of them a palimpsest of artifacts that stretch for a couple hundred meters long. And uh, I happened to do my dissertation research on this particular complex uh, where I got a, a PhD out of UNR in 2004, 20 long years ago. <laughs> Feels like another life, I have to admit. 
Now, these sites were used for resource acquisition and processing. And moreover, a number of other smaller localities also used for resource acquisition and processing are present just west along the margins of Crater Flat. And I've highlighted Crater Flat here for you. In addition to the resource acquisition and processing sites, uh, there are intensive uh, raw material toolstone tool quarries. One is a fine grain volcanic quarry, actually welded tough, that's approximately three to 400 meters in diameter and contains thousands of flakes and hundreds of cores and bifaces in various stages of manufacture. And in the 1990s, I participated in the collection and uh, test excavations at this site. And the cobble sizes of the cores can be as large as your head, if not bigger. And the bifaces are as big as your hand. And we even collected a pinto point that was as big as your hand. So because of the large package size of welded tough, you can make these large spear points that are common for the Western stem tradition. Now, ancestral pneumatic occupations, like throughout the Great Basin, are much more common and widespread throughout the NNSS, whereas the Clovis and Western Tim stem tradition sites are primarily located in that southwestern corner. And these ancestral lumic sites are distinguished by various types of projectile points that many of you are probably familiar with, gypsum cave, gatecliff split stem, Humboldt desert side notched, cottonwood styles. And later in time, after about AD 1000, you begin to pick up intermountain brownware ceramics, or uh, they're also called Shoshone brownware or Great Basin brownware, and they become relatively common. Occasionally, you might find a Virgin Anasazi or Fremont style ceramic shirt. In addition, grinding assembly assemblages are also commonly found at these ancestral pneumic occupations. Now, none of these archaeological sites would be surprising to the archaeologist who's listening to me right now, because these kinds of sites and their assemblages are common throughout the Great Basin and Intermountain West. Perhaps the most visually appealing of the ancestral pneumic sites are those associated with rock art or rock writings and geoglyphs. And here's a, here's a photo of one rock shelter site. Uh, it's called Tungwash Rock Shelter, uh, a geographic place name. And it's located at the eastern escarpment of Rainier Mesa, about the north central part of the NNSS. And you can see in this slide that there's a series of simple geometric or abstract motifs pecked into the patina in the back of the rock shelter. We also have pictograph sites out there. Uh, this is from what's called the Bighorn Rock Shelter. And you can see a bighorn sheet pictograph element right in the middle of this slide. I believe there are two or three of those pictograph elements at this rock shelter. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, this rock shelter is the only one that contains bighorn sheep elements. Although I'm not exactly certain about that, but I think that's the case. Along with pictogra pictographs and petroglyphs, I believe there are two geoglyphs. Here is one of them. This is an overview slide, and you can see a series of oblong or oval rock uh, alignments in the middle of this photograph on that white bedrock. I hope you can pick that out, but let me show you a closer view of it right there. And you, uh, interesting to note how sodded or, sub, uh, well, sodded into the ground these uh, rocks are. It just goes to show that they've been there for quite a while. Now, the Nevada National Security Site comprises part of the homelands for 16 different Paiute and Shoshone tribes. And based on the knowledge we've gained over years from uh, the tribal members and elders who we have consulted with, who have consulted with us, 
a number of habitation sites and small villages are located on the NNSS. Excuse me. For instance, one of them is Big George's Cave. And I think Big George is actually right next to this geoglyph. It is uh, the first site recorded in Nye County 26 and Y1. Other habitation sites or small villages include ammonia tanks, White Rock Spring, Oak Spring, Tobapaw and Tipapaw Springs, among others. And the noted anthropologist Julian Stewart, whose last name happens to be Haynes, H A Y N E S, uh, also, I hope that's right. Maybe I'll think about Alfred Krober. Anyhow, uh, also documented in his off sided work. Basin Plateau Aboriginal sociopolitical groups, nine such villages or res residences on these lands. And many of you have probably read through Julian Stewart's book. And when you read the descriptions of these villages, they're extensive in that they, they occur within, say, a half mile of a spring or a known water source. And they consist of several small nuclear or extended families, say, 30 or 40 people at the most. So they're nothing, they're nothing like the, the village of uh, Oribe on the Hopi Mesas, where you have a group of people living in a compact Pueblo. Nothing like that, very different. So moving on to historic European American mining and ranching resources, the widespread occupation of the NNSS by European Americans began at the beginning of the 20th century. And naturally, of course, it coincides with the boom towns of Tonopah, Goldfield, and Rhyolite, uh, none of which are very far from the NNSS. And European American resources that predate nuclear testing in the 20th century consist of these mining sites and ranching resources. And this is a photograph of what's called the mining uh, climax mine and it's located in the far northern extent of the national security site. And you can see an ore hopper that is still standing. Up to the right is a, a broken down rail ore cart trussel that went out to the uh, ore hopper, and that is sitting upon a waste rock pile. The actual adit is going back into this hill, and you can't really pick it out in this uh, photograph. This particular mine ran from, I think, approximately the late 30s up through the early 50s and into the period of nuclear testing. So it was still running while nuclear testing began on the NNSS. And here's another photograph of uh, the ore hopper, uh, the broken down ore cart trussle, and the top of the waste rock pile. Now, of course, to operate a mining site, you need to have something to eat. So there are also small ranching sites on the national security site. And here is a cabin from one of them. This particular cabin is in this beautiful meadow called Gold Meadows. Beautiful in the summer, snow covered in the winter. Uh, it's at the northern edge of the NNSS and off to the upper right, are the is the crest of the Kawi train. So it's really far north uh, on the federal reservation. And you can see it's fairly substantial. Uh, the this house is partially collapsed. You can see a bunch of milled lumber there, uh, made also with corrugated tin for the uh, for the roof. Uh, if you were to look in the front of it, you could see that you could scoot in there still if you needed to and surrounding it is a fairly dense scatter of historic European American artifacts. Here is a trailer or a cart that was at the site as well. It's pretty substantial as you can see. And then if you're gonna live any place for some time, you kind of need one of these, you know, a toilet. Now, the last set of resources I'm going to talk about here are related to historic nuclear testing activities. And here is an iconic slide that if any of you are familiar with the uh, NNSS, which used to be called the uh, Nevada test site, 
I mean, this pops right into your mind when you think about it. This is uh, Yucca Flat with all the subsidence craters from, you know, 800 or so shaft tests or something like that, a, a great deal of shaft tests. In the late 1940s, the federal government began searching for a continental nuclear test site. Now, there were a number of requirements that they were looking for. First of all, it had to be remote from major population centers. And you can imagine in the late 40s, this certainly was. Excuse me. Not so much nowadays. It needed to have favorable and predictable weather conditions to allow for year-round testing. And a Midwest friend of mine, as he tells me about Las Vegas, he'll say, Las Vegas doesn't have any weather. It just has climate. It's either hot or it's mild. Well, can't disagree with him out there. We don't get tornadoes. We don't get weeks long snow. We don't get weeks long of rain. We don't have to stay indoors. Well, we do have to stay indoors for three months, but it's not in the winter. <laughs> it's climate. Thirdly, the land had to be under federal control. And at this time, in the late 40s, it was controlled for the Las Vegas bombing and gunnery range. So on the recommendation of various agencies, President Harry Truman approved the Continental Test Location on December 18, 1950, or what we know today as the Nevada Nuclear Security Site. Um, a little town of Mercury was built in the southeastern corner of the installation, a couple miles from US 95, and over time, 928 nuclear tests would be conducted here. They are generally divided up in two types, atmospheric testing from 1951 to 1962, and underground tests that primarily ran from 1963 to 1992. And the last nuclear test took place on September 23rd. 1992 as a result of a self-imposed national moratorium on nuclear testing. And as an aside, I first went out onto the Nevada test site on October 21st of 1992, almost a month after the last test. And I gotta tell you, at that time, Mercury was bustling. It was very, very busy. Uh, today, it's far more quiet. Uh, if you want a relaxing night without a lot of lights, a lot, a lot of, not a lot of sounds, not a lot of traffic, Mercury is your place, I got to tell you. Uh, additionally, in the 90s, if you were to go out in Las Vegas and talk to someone uh, at the grocery store or something, most people knew about the Nevada test site, what was going on out there, and knew people that worked out there. And it's interesting to come back to Las Vegas in uh, the 2020s and find that very few people uh, know what's going on out there or know people that work there. And it's more often than not, they'll say, something's still going on out there? I thought that's been shut down for years. Of course, that's not true. They no longer do nuclear tests out there, as I said. The last one was in 1992, but they do other kinds of testing. Now I wanna move briefly and talk about Cold War resources on the NNSS and National Register of Historic Places uh, evaluations. Uh, now the Cold War is recognized by the National Park Service as an important theme in US history. And just last year, the Park Service published a historic context statement for it called Protecting America, Cold War Defensive Sites, a National Historic Landmarks Theme Study. And if you were to type in that title on an online uh, search engine, this thing would pop right up and you could read it at night for yourself. Actually, it's a pretty interesting read. I've read most of it. Uh, but I think there are only two sentences in this entire uh, context that talk about the NNSS. There are a couple other important um, historic context statements for the NNSS. Another one was written in 1992 by the National Park Service for scientific uh, reserves like Los Alamos, 
and uh, technolo important technological equipment, like those associated with the, uh, a Manhattan Project. The other important historic context statement was written by Desert Research Institute uh, for the NNSS itself and has been recently uh, revised. So those are three important historic context statements for the Nevada National Security Site and uh, evaluating historic properties for the National Register. Now the period of significance set out by this particular volume, Protecting America, Cold War Defensive Sites, starts in 1945 with the surrender of Germany, and it ends in 1991 with the fall of the Soviet Union. The period of significance for the Nevada National Security Site is from 1951, the year it started and the first nuclear test happened, to 1992, the year the last nuclear test took place. And most Cold War resources out there are determined eligible to the National Register under criteria A and C. Now, criterion A, uh, if you are an NHPA wonk, relates to, and here I quote, properties that are associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history, as defined by an appropriate historic context. Most, if not all, Cold War historic properties on the National Security Site are determined eligible under this particular criterion. Criterion C relates to properties that, in part, and here I quote again, embody distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction. And many Cold War properties here are determined eligible under this particular criterion. And this is because they are part of a unique industrial landscape. Now just think, during the Cold War, 1951 to 1992, there were really only two such places on the earth like this, one in the US and one in the Soviet Union. Also, uh, many, of the prop many of the historic properties here are highly specialized designs that are part of nuclear testing. Indeed, many of the historic properties on the NNSS represent singular, one-of-a-kind resources found nowhere else in the US, perhaps nowhere else in the world. Most Cold War historic properties on the NNSS are not determined eligible under Criterion B. And this is because most of the historically important individuals are famous not for their association with the National Security Site, but for their scientific work in other laboratories like Los Alamos, like Lawrence Livermore, uh, like Sandia Labs. Likewise, most Cold War historic properties on the NNSS are not eligible under D because many have been partially dismantled or destroyed for kind of obvious reasons. And most of the significant data lies not in their current physical expression, but rather in their scientific and archival record. Moreover, there are many Cold War properties, for instance, the Huron King test chamber, which we'll talk about, normally not eligible because it's under the 50 year threshold for the National Register, but they are eligible because of criteria consideration G, properties achieving significance within the past 50 years because they are exceptionally important and unique to nuclear testing. So with that, I'm, I'm gonna move on to the two resources I'd like to highlight, the glass houses and the Huron King test chamber and I'm just wondering, Samantha, uh, are there are there any questions at this point? Maybe something brief I might I might try to answer. There aren't any right now, so just keep going. Okay. So with that introduction to new nuclear testing activities as a historic theme, I now want to talk about a particular resource or resources called the glass houses. Now. 
Here is a photo of one of the glass houses. It sits on the floor of Frenchman Flat. Um, and you can see there are a lot of places for windows in that glass house, but there's not a lot of windows right now. <laughs> Um, as I mentioned, 100 atmospheric tests took place on the NNSS between 1951 and 1962. And these devices were initially dropped from airplanes, but later placed closer to the ground on top of towers, elevated by balloons, or, or elevated by balloons to a desired height. Now, an important objective of some of these tests was to determine what's called the physical effects of nuclear weapons on various objects, materials, structures, and buildings. A common effects test, as it is called, would use identical items placed at varying distances from a nuclear detonation or ground zero. Greg? Yeah. Somebody asked, would this be the Doomtown area? Would it be the Boomtown? The Doom Town area. No, it wouldn't. I don't believe so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't. I don't believe so. And uh, if I'm wrong, maybe Jeff or Megan can well type it out. Type type it out for you if they're still on. Yeah, Jeff did. He answered the question. You're good. Okay. Let's see. So uh, a common effects test would use identical items placed at varying distances from a nuclear detonation or ground zero. And so each of these items would then be exposed to the shock waves and attendant radiation at known distances from the detonation or ground zero. And then following the nuclear test, observation or measurements were made regarding the effects of the test on these items given their distance from ground zero. And this scenario is exactly the kind of scientific effects test, quote unquote, for which the so-called glass houses were used. Now, this photograph is of a glass house that was 20,000 feet from ground zero. Now it is, I did record it in 2023, so I don't know how much of the glass and the window frame fell out because of the detonation. You know, it, it's been that long. Lots of people have been out here. You never know if there's some, you know, you never know what happens out here. Um, but then there's another building. There's that one. It was built at 12,000 feet from ground zero. So 20,000 feet, the last, last picture, about four miles away, 12,000 feet from ground zero, about 2,000 miles. Two, two miles away, excuse me, from ground zero. And then the last one, the first one and closer to ground zero was at 7,600 feet. Now, an interesting thing about this, of course, is that they're identical buildings. And the only way I know that's the 20,000 foot, uh, the house at 20,000 feet away from ground zero, and that's the house at 12,000 feet away is a little sign right there. And I don't know if you can pick it up. It says F-3.16B. The sign closest to ground zero is the same thing, but it was A. And the one at 20,000 feet was the same thing, but it was C. And I have to admit, looking at these slides, I scratch my head and I think about uh, that comedian, Bill Ingvall with the uh, blue collar comedy, who had that, uh, that bit part uh, or a skit about Here's your side. <laughs> That's the only way I could distinguish this, this particular glass house from the other one uh, is with that sign in the photograph. <laughs> um, oh, so let's see. Let me pick up to where I am. So without belaboring the point, you can readily see why these, these buildings are colloquial, colloquially referred to as glass houses. Each of the buildings had a number of different windows and window treatments on their walls. In fact, there were 18 different windows and window treatments. And uh, you might note the uh, skylight jutting up uh, from the roof on one side of the building. 
Official documents state the purpose of the glass houses was to determine the effects of a nuclear detonation on different kinds of glass windows, window frames, screens, inside curtains, and exterior shields like louvers. And you can see one of the louvers here on the ground. And let me just give a shout out to uh, my uh, colleagues, Megan Stuvey and uh, Nicole Brannon, who went out in the field and helped me uh, record that and assisted with uh, producing the architectural resource assessment form for these, for these sites. Uh, in fact, this particular plan map, I sketched quickly in the field, but Manuel de Cespedes Molina was the one who uh, uh, drew it very nicely for the ARA form. So I, I thank all three of them for their help. Now, each of these structures were made by tacking together seven cubicle-like rooms, each made with sheets of plywood attached to a wooden frame. Each of the rooms were approximately eight by feet, eight feet square and 10 feet high. Five rooms made up a primary north-south orientation whereas two other rooms were attached to the west elevation, one on the north side, one on the south side, creating a U-shaped design. And it was the long eastern face that faced ground zero. The cubicles are joined by using one quarter inch angle iron, one quarter inch thick angle iron bolted to the roof, the foundation, and to the wall joints. Access into the building and between rooms occurred through crawlways cut through the plywood at the base of the walls. All those characteristics you can see in this photograph. You can see the plywood, you can see window framing, uh, wooden window framing that is. You can see the quarter inch thick angle iron, uh, the crawlways. And in this particular crawlway, you can see the remains of a uh, pack rat mid. Now, you can also see that the structure sits right on the ground surface. The ground surface had no preparation. So to hold it in place during the detonation, uh, it was held in place by iron brackets, thick wire cables, and rebar tie-downs. So the wire cables were attached to the rebar tie-downs, and these were cemented into the ground about 10 and a half feet from the base. And you can imagine if there weren't these rebar tie downs, this, this thing might tumble because of the shock waves from the nuclear detonation. Today, the only glass houses that remain on Frenchman Flat is the one at 20,000 feet and the one at 12,000 feet. The glass house closest to ground zero, zero at 7,600 was surprisingly not destroyed by the detonation but simply removed it sometime between 1957 and 2023. And we know that because uh, in 1957, these three glass houses were examined after a number of other nuclear tests. So there's one example of an atmospheric test historic property. Let me move to uh, an atmosphere or a, a historic property that's associated with an underground shaft test, and that is the Huron King test chamber. Most underground tests at the NNSS between 1963 and 1992 were conducted in vertical shafts on Yucca and Frenchman Flats or in horizontal tunnels in Paiute and Aqueduct Mesas. The Huron King test itself was an underground shaft test that took place on Yucca Flat on June 24, 1960. And this, as you can see, is a, a before action photograph. The Huron King test chamber sits in the middle of an open circular area. There's wire electrical cabling and communication cabling that goes back to the trailer, what's called a trailer lot. And then I'm not sure if I can identify it, but there are two objects off by themselves and those to the kind of the middle left of the frame. And those are winches to pull back the test chamber. 
Now, the cost of this experiment at the time was approximately $10.3 million. I have no idea what that equates to nowadays. Its purpose was to evaluate the effects of an electromagnetic shock wave or pulse and radiation on a military communication satellite. Now, an obvious question at this point is, how could such a test be accomplished when the nuclear detonation occurred underground? In fact, it occurs about 1,050 feet underground. Well, to solve this problem, a, a bunch of brilliant engineers came up with a specially designed above ground test chamber called Huron King Test Chamber. Uh, and it was built to hold a model defense communication satellite in a tank, in a vacuum tank that is, meant to replicate the space environment. And here is cutaway of the Huron King test chamber. Now the Huron King test itself had a number of unique engineering features. First was the test chamber. Second was that the nuclear device was placed 1,050 feet below the ground surface with a specially designed pipe that extended vertically up from the detonation chamber and connected to the above ground test chamber. And that connection was made by that round circular uh, structure on the right side of the test chamber, the right side of this frame. Third, once the detonation took place, the test chamber had to be sealed off before debris blasted up through the uh, shaft and destroyed the interior of the test chamber. And last, the test chamber had to be mobile. It had to be retracted from ground zero before a subsidence crater formed. So let me show you the after action photograph. You can see the detonation uh, or subsidence crater. You can see the Huron King test chamber has been winched or moved back. And you can see the electronic cabling and then the trailer park over there. I um, While I did this, I got to speak to one of the engineers associated with this uh, experiment. And he talked about a couple of interesting things. Uh, one was the winches. Talked about a lot of different interesting things, but uh, here, one was the winches. There was a primary winch and an alternate winch. The primary winch pulled the thing back, but if it failed, they had an alternate winch to move the thing as well. They did not need that alternate winch. The uh, Huron King test chamber was separated from the line of sight shaft to the detonation chamber by uh, explosives. The explosives also had a primary set and an alternate secondary set. And what the engineer told me was that the primary set did not blow correctly. So they had to do an alternate. They had to use the alternate set. So and here I wanna, I wanna pretty much quote from uh, the Huron test chamber description. And I wanna shout out to Jeff Wedding who wrote this description. And uh, if you know Jeff, uh, you can see why this is totally him here. The Huron King test chamber is an impressive mobile structure sitting on the floor of Yucca Flat. And I'll interject here, of course, this is before the test itself, you can see that they uh, covered it in white insulation. Uh, as you can imagine, that test chamber is supposed to be in a cold vacuum. And on June 24th, it's pretty dang hot out there. I'll continue with Jeff's description. The tracked behemoth gives the popular cultural impression of an oversized steampunk locomotive or a Jawa sand crawler from the Star Wars movie. At first, the scale of the test chamber is difficult to gauge from afar and without other, and without other objects nearby for reference. So here I am at the edge of the uh, test chamber and I'm five foot seven. So you can imagine there's, you know, seven to 10 of me to get up to the top of that chamber. I also want to say, uh, you know, mostly in, in, in technical reports like this, we don't really put in references to popular culture, but that so works. 
that so works for this resource. The entire structure is approximately 60 feet long, 40 feet wide, and guessing from my height, the five foot seven, about 35 feet tall. It weighed 50 tons. Uh, I'll also say that Manuel de Cespedes Molina went out with Jeff and I to record this. All three of us were out there recording it. And I can guarantee you it was not on June 24th. The test chamber was designed by Lockheed Space and Missile Corporation using government provided sketches and specifications. It was fabricated by Todd Shipyard of Seattle, Washington, a subsidiary of Boeing Aerospace. And once all the individual components were manufactured, they were transported to the Nevada National Security Site and assembled on site. And as I recall, there were a couple photographs that showed all the different parts spread out in a yard. That is before assembly. It's also clear from our field work that the instrumentation control houses on either side of the test chamber, like this one, was built at the NNSS and fitted onto the structure. So let me just highlight a number of main features of this unique historic property. The test chamber chassis was composed, composed of a modified Caterpillar D9 bulldozer chassis, and there were I-beams fitted to form a rectangular frame around it. To make the entire test chamber mobile, four tracks, each one sourced from a Caterpillar D9 bulldozer, were placed at each corner of the structure. There was a vacuum tank, that big circular thing in the middle, used to hold the model satellite. And in this cutout illustration, you can see the model satellite in there. There was a large circular bolted entryway to allow satellite ingress and egress. Let me see if I can get you a picture of that. That round circular, that round circular thing on the side of the test chamber was the entryway. Two large vacuum tubes to create the space vacuum environment was attached to either side of the test chamber. And you can see those illustrated here as well. There was a lower control house with instrumentation associated with the vacuum tubes on one side of the structure. Then there was a larger control house at the back of the test chamber right here to the right for instrumentation and data collection for the model satellite. And then finally, there's a large upright cylinder-like structure at the opposite end uh, of the vacuum tank that connected to the 1,050-foot long detonation shaft. Now, the satellite was developed by the General Electric Space Division and referred to as STARSAT, System Test Analysis and Research Satellite. And it was similar in design to the DSCS-3 communication satellite then in use by Department of Defense. The satellite measured 7.5 meters long from one tip of the solar panel to another, and it weighed approximately 2,000 pounds. And this particular photograph is interesting because it looks like they are in the test chamber itself uh, putting together the satellite. Uh, you can see the rounded part of the tank at the top of the frame and the satellite being held up by uh, metal, metal rods or something like that. Uh, really interesting photograph. I, I think we found two of this, uh, of the satellite, uh, during the archival review. So following the Huron King test, this test chamber was moved about 600 meters north northwest from where the test took place. And that is still where this very interesting and unique nuclear testing property still resides. That's what it looks like right now today. Now, the chamber was scheduled to be used for at least one other test 
but testing technology advanced, and this never happened. According to a report writ written 30 years after the event, the engineers deemed this uh, experiment highly successful. So kudos, kudos to them. Now, I hope you can see that from a technological and scientific standpoint, the Huron King Test Chamber is a significant nuclear testing related historic property. Because it was made in 1980, criteria consideration G allows it to be evaluated for the National Register of Historic Places. And our technical report, along with the associated uh, architectural resource form, is at the SHPO's office right now going through concurrence. I also hope you can see how unique the glass houses are uh, built from materials easily obtained at the time by anyone in the United States and their importance in atmospheric effects tests on the NNSS. So with that, uh, I'm done with my presentation and I'm willing to take any questions uh, uh, and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. Uh, if you have a question about this little dog here, his name is Jasper and uh, he was our oversized barter collie. And it's the only grumpy picture I have of him. I think I woke him up after a nap. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Uh, you can put it in the question answer section if you do. Or there's a chat going on. Wonderful presentation, Greg. That's one of the first things. Somebody oh. said, can the public visit the site? You know, you can visit the site. And I believe you have to uh, register beforehand through the nuclear uh, the Atomic Testing Museum. I could be wrong there, um, but um, I would call uh, I would call the Atomic Testing Museum and ask them about that. Yeah, I think that I did that. It's you have to like apply six months ahead of time on their website, and then they'll let you know when it's available. I, I have heard that. In fact, the first time I ever was out there was on a tour. Yeah. Me too. Other questions? Well, a bunch of people are saying thanks, Greg. Hey, a great presentation. You're let, let me shout out to uh, uh, the cultural resource management team here at DRI in general. Um, uh, the program manager is Laura O'Neill, a very capable architectural historian. And to tell you the truth, um, the program runs seamlessly uh, worth here in charge. And we have, oh, I don't know, eight people, a uh, number of full-time on staff for CRMP, and uh, a number of us like myself who really are only part-time. Uh, you probably should try to have Laura come on sometime and talk about uh, uh, the historic properties on the national security site. She would do a great job. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, how much, so somebody else had a question, how much time passed between the detonation and the formation of the crater? You know, I'm not exactly sure, but it's in a matter of minutes. I, I think the whole event at the Huron King Test Chamber took about three to nine minutes before the subsidence crater occurred. I'm not exactly sure, but I believe it's within minutes. It's not like instantaneously. The, the detonation was, you know, 1,050 feet under the ground. So it took a while for everything to compact down into a, into a subsidence crater. Cool. Other questions? The, okay, they were wondering if the Huron King wasn't mobile, it was pulled? Like, did they pull it instead of to move it oh. around? That's true. It did not have an engine, so it had these large iron hooks on either side that could be hooked up to a, you know, a D9 caterpillar, supposedly, something that could pull 50 tons and move it. So it did not have an engine itself. It had to be moved by another piece of heavy equipment. And it, it was moved, like I said, 600 meters away from where the test took place after the whole thing was done.
Any other questions? Do you know what the results were of the test? Could an EMP take out a satellite network? You know, I wish I could answer that. I, I don't know. Um, I, I guess I didn't key in on that because uh, I was more interested in creating historic context and and uh, writing about it as a historic property. And I did this about a year ago, I have to admit. But I, I do not know the answer to that question right off the top of my head. And I apologize for that. Sorry, Jim. <laughs> oh, and uh, by the way, once it comes out of SHPO review, it will go to what's called OSTI, which is uh, uh, the federal repository for uh, technical reports that can be accessed by uh, the general public. So once it gets on OSTI, I suppose you could just go online and type on here on King Test Chamber and the report should pop up. But that uh, that one happened probably for several months down the road. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> um, we had somebody who raised their hand. Um, can you write your your question in the chat or in the question answer? Um, I don't know how to allow you to talk out loud. I think there's a way, but I have I don't know it very well. Yeah, I don't I don't see it. All right, well, let's give her a minute. Well, and as you were talking, Jeff was answering questions, <laughs> which was nice. So it was it was a good combination. Oh, good. Yeah. But, um, really, I, I work there part time. There are people like Jeff and uh, Megan, Nicole and and Laura, who Tatiana Menical particularly, and Laura, who runs the program that are are more knowledgeable about it than I am. I just happen to record these two particularly interesting resources. <laughs> They're very cool. They are. They are. Uh, I was pretty lucky to somehow get the draw of those resources. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, here, somebody wrote, I noticed that under the chat, someone asked if the soil still have res residual ra radioactivity. No, it does not. But I wouldn't dig. <laughs> I wouldn't go digging around. I can walk. You can walk out there without any problem whatsoever. But I wouldn't go digging around and and uh, ingest. You know, breathing in the dirt. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't risk it. But you can walk around out there normally, no problem. Okay. Well. Um, I want to thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for doing all of this, and um, yeah. thank You're all welcome. of your coworkers for for being able to help and, and support and everything like that. Um, uh, it was really wonderful having you here. It was wonderful to hear this talk because there's so many things where people wonder what's going on out there, and that's really nice to be able to hear a little bit about it. Yeah. Uh, again, it's you know it's a unique it's a unique place because. Really, there are only two places in the world like it. <laughs> one here and one on the other side of the world, the Soviet Union, or now Russia. And nowadays, of course, China probably has one in North Korea. But in the Cold War, there were just two of them. 